uh, start with the <laughs> start with the introduction. Um, so, as you see from the notification on your screen, just wanted to give you a heads up that this um, talk is being recorded. Um, uh, uh, yeah, welcome. So, welcome to the Last Drop Water Researchers uh, Speaker Series. Um, if you have an interest in water sustainability issues, the speaker series is for you. Um, the Last Drop Speaker Series is brought to you by the University of Manitoba Sustainable Development Goal Six Working Group. Um, so in 2018, the University of Manitoba was named the United Nations Academic Impact Hub or the UNAI Hub for Sustainable Development Goal 6 on clean water and sanitation. We're the only academic institution who holds this UNAI designation in North America. Um, so this SDG working group at the UM brings together established and emerging leaders um, who have a shared interest in freshwater sustainability and who work collaboratively with local, national, and global partners to address issues related to water. Members include researchers from the Clayton H. Riddell Faculty of Environment, Earth, and Resources, the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences, Faculty of Arts, and the Faculty of Science, as well as collaborators at the Center for the Advancement of Teaching and Learning, and the Office of Sustainability, as well as the Center for Human Rights Research. The Sustainable Development uh, Group's expertise spans multiple disciplines, um, including leading researchers from across the humanities, social sciences, and STEM fields. Um, my name is Nicole Wilson. I'm an assistant professor and Canada Research Chair in Arctic Environmental Change and Governance at the Center for Earth Observation Science um, in the CHR Faculty of Environment, Earth and Resources. And I co-chair um, this group with Claire Herbert. Um, we have about 75 people registered today. So I'm uh, really happy that so many people are joining us. And I wanna especially note that um, we know that there are two student groups um, joining us who have organized in-person screenings. So um, there, there are even more attending that way, including the Anti-Colonial and Environmental Justice Group at the University of Michigan, and uh, one here also um, in the CHR uh, Faculty of Environment at University of Manitoba. Um, so the, in this virtual format, we're all coming from different locations. Um, many locations, given the number of people registered, I'm sure. Um, so I want to acknowledge that I'm located in Winnipeg, Manitoba, on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Red River Métis Nation. Um, in the theme of today's panel, I uh, also want to acknowledge that my drinking water um, here in Winnipeg comes from Shoal Lake through the Winnipeg Aqueduct, uh, which was constructed in 1919 at the expense of Shoal Lake 40 First Nations water security. Um, I invite everybody um, to uh, kind of reflect on <laughs> where they're located today um, and, and where their drinking water comes from um, and uh, feel free to put it uh, in the chat. Um, today we have our second talk in the series. Um, by Professor M.A. Kraft. Uh, before we begin, I'll just mention a couple logistics. Um, we've enabled closed captioning functions, so please feel free to turn that on as needed. We'll be recording the event, as I, as I mentioned, and um, a video will be hosted on our UM Sustainability YouTube channel after the talk. So please mute yourself during the presentation. Um, Pauline Tennant from the Center for Human Rights uh, Research um, has been so helpful in organizing all of this, and she'll be uh, putting some links in the chat um, to that YouTube channel. Um, our presentation will be about 30 minutes. Um, there will be a Q&A period at the end, so feel free to put questions in the Q&A box. Um, finally, I'd like to say um, that for members of our audience uh, who'd like to learn more or join the SDG Working Group, um, you can visit our website. Um, again, Pauline will kindly uh, put the link in the chat. Um, and you can find information there about our upcoming talks as well as recordings, um, links to recordings of previous talks, both in this um, year's series as well as last year. Um, so now um, let's begin. Um, we have M.A. Kraft, uh, Professor M.A. Kraft presenting on building legal relationships of responsibility to and with uh, Nibe or water. So M.A. Kraft um, is an award-winning teacher and researcher uh, recognized internationally as a leader in the area of Indigenous laws, treaties, and water. She holds a university research chair uh, in Nibe 
Minawa Aki and Akinagewen, um, Indigenous Governance in Relationship with Land and Water. Um, she, uh, as an associate professor at the, uh, the Faculty of Common Law at the University of Ottawa and an Indigenous um, Anishinaabe Métis legal um, lawyer from Treaty One territory in Manitoba. She is the former director of the National Inquiry into Missing Murdered uh, Indigenous Women and Girls and the founding director of research at the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, <clears throat> she practiced at the Public Interest Law Center for over a decade, and in 2016, she was voted one of the top 25 most influential lawyers in Canada. Uh, in 2021, she was awarded the prestigious Canadian Bar Association uh, President's Award and was named the Early Career Researcher of the Year um, at the University of Ottawa. Um, Professor Kraft prioritizes Indigenous-led um, and interdisciplinary research, including through kind of visual arts and film, uh, co-leads a series of major research grants on decolonizing water governance and works with many Indigenous nations and communities on Indigenous relationships with and responsibilities to Nibe. Um, there are many more accomplishments that I could list today, um, but in the interest of uh, getting to our talk, um, I'll invite you to take a look at MA's website as well as the website for um, the SHRC uh, partnership funded um, uh, project called Decolonizing Water Governance that we'll put a link uh, to their website in the chat as well. Um, so MA, uh, without further ado, I'll uh, give you the floor. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for the invitation to join you and to uh, the Center for Human Rights Research for supporting this, um, as well as the SDG Working Group. Um, I'm joining you from Treaty 1 territory as well, but actually on Lake Winnipeg, where the water flows in from the Winnipeg River into the lake. So that's just here as a reminder to me about those relationships as well. And that's where uh, my drinking water is drawn from, uh, the water table here in, in this territory. Um, as was mentioned, I uh, have the responsibility for a research chair in Nibe Minwa Kinakunagewen, so Indigenous Governance in Relationship with Land and Water. And that's what I wanted to, to share today and hoping we can have a, a discussion about how we build uh, legal relationships that res respond to or recognize our responsibilities for, for governing, but not governing over water, not treating it as something to be governed, but thinking about what our sets of responsibilities are uh, in relationship to water. And each and every one of us can take that up in a variety of different forms and already, as was mentioned, acknowledging um, where our uh, drinking water comes from and the lands and waters that we're responsible to and for um, uh, is, is an important, that's an important part of how we take up that responsibility. I have some slides that I'm going to share um, and, uh, and hopefully they can supplement part of the discussion. I would encourage you to um, put your questions in the Q&A function and also um, some comments into the chat if you uh, would like. And definitely in the chat, tell us where you're, um, where you're joining from. I understand that some of you are joining from uh, very remote uh, locations or other countries, um, we'd love to uh, to hear from you. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the Wanganui River and a, a water exchange, and I'll, I might I'll speak to that a little bit more later. Um, but thinking about how those relationships that we have within our own territories are significant, but how we build relationships across boundaries, and one of the things to note about water is that it defies geopolitical boundaries. In some cases, it refuses to be governed by uh, affirmations of jurisdiction and authority over it. So uh, that's kind of the crux of, of what I want to chat about today. And a lot of that work that um, is feeding into this thinking for me is coming from our, uh, our research group, Decolonizing Water, that uh, it's not the water itself that's being decolonized, it's more the human interactions and the attempts to govern water that are being, uh, or that are proposed to be decolonized. And the research uh, group has worked with um, Indigenous nations in a variety of different contexts in building, uh, building up their governance and laws relating to, uh, to water. And we'll chat about some of those today. 
um, this grant as a social sciences and humanities research, research council grant is coming to a close uh, in the next year. And uh, we're already thinking about re-envisioning decolonizing water 2.0. And I'm looking at the slogan, I'm thinking, where do we put the 2.0? Um, because the work is far from done. Uh, one of the elements that I would note uh, as significant is in rebuilding Indigenous governance uh, relating to water and thinking about roles and responsibilities that are rooted in Indigenous laws and legal orders, um, there's an obligation to also think about its application and how, in many cases, you can have an activity of rebuilding or acknowledging Indigenous law but what is its connection to, how does it sit alongside, complement, or interact in any way, or remain separate in um, the exercise of other forms of law, including state law. So the interaction of different legal systems is an important consideration and collaboration around water governance. Um, and that kind of ties to um, a lot of the different work that I've done on treaties and hydroelectric development, reconciliation, those are all uh, deeply connected in how we understand these waterscapes. And, you know, I could put up a, a map of Manitoba right now to show where I'm situated, but I actually wanted to show this is um, situatedness. So these are different kinds of boundaries. And what treaties did was actually use water as forms of delineating space. And then at some point in time, we had kind of these geopolitical boundaries of straight lines up and down north, north, south, defining the breaks between provinces. And uh, this is water. Uh, this is the southern basin of Lake Winnipeg. And you see the Winnipeg River flowing in on the right hand side of the screen. And from the left bottom corner uh, is the Red River flowing into uh, the, the south basin of Lake Winnipeg. This water um, you know, from the, the east, southeast, it's coming from the United States, the rainy Namakin, right, uh, you know, north of the boundary of where the Mississippi watershed starts. Uh, the water is also coming up again from the United States through the, the Red River. And then, you know, we don't see it in this image, but we have all of the water flowing from the west into the Lake Winnipeg watershed and into the lake um, at Grand Rapids and, and coming from as far as the um, the Rocky Mountains and from the glaciers in that region. So this is a pretty significant expanse of space that you can see here uh, and involving all kinds of jurisdictions. So we see that there's no real clean, nice fit of the geopolitical boundaries of states and provinces and countries that fits uh, with how water is actually moving within that uh, waterscape. And the question then becomes, you know, what, which law, what, what law are we applying when we have um, these confluences of, of waters within these geopolitical boundaries? And we also have different forms of waters. So often we think about water bodies as what is ripe for governance, but different forms of water, swamp water, fresh water, rain water, you know, we need to think about these different forms, snow, um, the, the different forms that water takes, and also the fact that what is within one form and in one jurisdictional area might actually move and morph and change to become something different. Um, so engaging all of these thoughts about different authorities um, as kind of tenuous when you engaged with water governance and water jurisdiction. And to a certain extent, this means that we need to think about domestic law, international law, and Indigenous laws and legal orders as we contemplate how we might better govern water for um, a, a positive water future. Um, so this is, you know, I don't want to get into great details here, but in terms of uh, federal jurisdiction and provincial jurisdiction, often we see some overlap, potentially disagreement. Um, and in Indigenous governance, we have uh, a significant amount of Indigenous law and legal order, but also constitutional obligations to Indigenous peoples, which now has been recognized as part of the water governance landscape in Canada. And we're really at a watershed moment. And I would say um, this is incredibly important because here we have 
images of Standing Rock, a big water conflict, and we see systems of law that are butting up against each other. Water defenders and protectors on the right, state enforcement of state law on the left-hand side. And we see even here in this image, you know, an imbalance of, of power, but the ultimate jurisdictional legal authority that is valid on both sides, just not corresponding uh, to one another, one another of these sets of, of obligations, of legal obligations. So these conflicts are likely to arise a lot more with insecure water futures. Um, and so we need to think about how how we might reconcile these or um, how we might develop systems of collaboration uh, that give effect to both systems of law or that resist uh, the imposition of other systems. And I said we're at a watershed, watershed moment in Canada because um, Canada has um, newly announced and currently being established water agency and a uh, uh, proposed fresh water action plan. And in that they've acknowledged um, the importance of regionally responsive initiatives um, that in watersheds that are of national significance and also to think about um, and include indigenous governance as essential to part of that governance. So that's a big development in I would say the water policy landscape in Canada. And in developing both of these, there's been a significant amount of in attempts to engage indigenous nations in redefining Canada's water future. Part of the reason for that, I think, is, uh, and, and we can all acknowledge that we're in a different moment in time. Uh, the TRC told us that reconciliation is essential and that that means establishing and man maintaining respectful relationships. And that to actually give effect to reconciliation, we'd have to have real societal change. So what does real societal change look like in the waterscape? It looks like an agency that coordinates, but that coordinates with Indigenous voices uh, at that table and thinking about freshwater action in uh, regional, um, in, in more regional ways, again, including Indigenous governance. And part of that is, as the TRC said, recognizing that UNDRIP is um, the cornerstone for reconciliation and UNDRIP itself contains a uh, significant amount of uh, engagement with water and lands, including concepts like free prior and informed consent prior to um, any impacts uh, or development in Indigenous territories and on uh, Indigenous resources, thinking about Indigenous institutions of governance. And here I signal UNDRIP Article 25 that speaks about the distinctive spiritual relationship that Indigenous people have with um, lands, territories, waters, coastal seas. And also I would just signal this last uh, sentence, last part of the sentence here, um, the right to uphold the re those responsibilities of sacred relationships or spiritual relationships for future generations. So that kind of sets the stage uh, in terms of where we're at in the Canadian waterscape and uh, this aligns with some of the work that I mentioned decolonizing water has been doing and which was originally supported um, through um, a grant received at the Center for Human Rights Research under the direction of Karen Busby, the previous, um, the founding director. And we looked at, as part of clean drinking water, uh, we actually kind of hived off a little piece that I worked on with some elders, a faculty of elders, that are still very active in working on water issues to flesh out uh, Anishinaabe law relating to uh, water itself, or Nibe. We have been holding a series of gatherings, Nibe gatherings, since 2013 to explore that relationship, recommit to the relationship. I love this photo because I look at some of these young people that are now adults driving cars and in university. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they've been committed to this work since they were uh, little tiny humans. And so that work continues um, on the basis of these principles that were acknowledged um, it, by the faculty of elders as being the foundation to Anishinaabe Nibe and Akunagewan or Anishinaabe water law. And um, an important thing to signal is that that ownership of water is um, 
it isn't part of that uh, that legal order, the Anishinaabe legal order. Um, so not owning water, recognizing that it has a spirit, that it is life, that it can heal, and also looking at some of the jurisdictional pieces. So um, the the responsibility of women to water, acknowledging that water can suffer and that we have corresponding responsibilities and that we also need to acknowledge the duality of water. So giving life and taking life and uh, inherent to all of that is the respect for uh, Nibi. And so how the, the elders came about these conclusions was drawing from spiritual sources of law that are then affected in laws of nature and then built into customary laws over time um, and exercised by nations for long periods of time. And using those different sources of law and building up these principles in a human and deliberative context, we then make decisions based on these sources of law and principles that derive from these sources of law. So this is a, a sense of the legal structure that is um, providing these, these guiding principles. What's interesting, I think, about this is to acknowledge that this is not human-made law for the most part. The decisions and the results in a given context will have that human and deliberative element, but that really these laws are given by the land and water itself, and that this framing of it even is an exercise in governance, a reflection of an Anishinaabe frame, but that it is not, um, that it emanates from the land itself. So the law uh, is given from the land and the water and the language to, to uh, acknowledge also late uh, Darcy Linklater who used to make that very important link on a regular basis. And they give rise to different uh, legal traditions. And on the left, you'll see the principal or the founding um, pillars of Inakrangewan or Anishinaabe law being relationships and a collective sense of well being. Whereas in this Western framework, we're looking at law primarily in uh, individual sets of rights and the protection of private property. And I'll encourage you to think back to that image that I showed you of Standing Rock and thinking about how those legal systems uphold those different sets of rights that you can see very visibly uh, in that visual representation of conflict, of con conflicting laws. And in thinking about not just individual relationships or adversarial relationships, thinking about this interconnected web of responsibilities uh, between all beings in creation and how there's an interdependency and a wovenness of uh, these different legal principles that are given effect through some of our actions um, that uh, are responding to land and water itself. And these are some of the images uh, from the Nibi gathering and an activity that helps us understand that relationship between uh, earth, uh, all, well, all of the dif different elements, earth, wind, air, um, and uh, and water. We have the fire that's present in that. Okay, so I want to connect this um, briefly to uh, a, a different framework of thinking. So this is not Indigenous laws and legal orders, but rather kind of a Western policy concept of rights of nature and thinking about how that's given effect in different contexts. Um, and also the legal personhood of water as kind of a contemporary manifestation of the thinking of rights of nature. So rights of nature is more like a 1970s movement of thought where the natural environment as a whole for the most part or in specific areas would be granted rights and would have spokespersons and have legal standing in court. When it comes to water and the more recent movement in um, 2017 really is the first direct affirmation of this concept to a water body. We're thinking about specific water bodies and the granting of one legal instrument or the, the use of one legal instrument of legal personhood to grant rights to a river to create that, um, that standing in um, Western legal context. So, uh, you know, water in and of itself or a water body like a river could not sue unless it had some kind of granted right to be able to engage in uh, litigation or to have legal personhood and have standing 
in uh, a court context or another legal context like a contract, for example. Basically, the idea was to be able to defend the rights of the river through um, humans, but on the basis of the personhood of the water. And so we ask these questions, what does being a person in law mean? Well, can that means that like a corporation or a municipality, you would have a right to sue and also be sued. Um, and the mechanisms by which you would do that is either recognition in a piece of legislation or agreement or court would recognize. So there's different approaches to how you would do that. Um, but some questions still arise as to the benefits and downfalls of that, how you actually frame out which bodies of water receive that personhood protection and thinking about whether or not personhood is actually an appropriate mechanism to recognize what Indigenous people around the world have been saying, which is water has a spirit um, and it has its own agency. So is legal personhood enough to give effect to that? And uh, currently we're doing some work to, with different Indigenous nations to ask that question within their different community uh, legal and governance contexts. And as I said, different ways of, of trying to achieve legal personhood, it's not a one size fits all. And these are just some of the approaches that have arisen around the world since 2017. Um, these are some of the examples, so not the mechanisms themselves, but the places. Um, and out of this, we can draw all of those different legal approaches. So when someone says legal personhood, um, my first question is, well, how? How is it given effect? And then what's the ultimate result? What's the the governing authority that attaches to that? How is it, how is that personhood actually given effect? Is it a council? Is it, um, you know, a broad declaration of multi-parties where, um, you know, we're going to have to sort out some of those important standing questions or authority questions or sets of responsibilities. Like for example, in the context of India, the government was responsible um, for in the original court ruling but wasn't able or decided not to take that up amongst the different um, departments that were affected. Um, and the question that I posed about Indigenous legal mechanisms, are they the same as legal personhood? I'd say they're a little bit different and they recognize the spiritedness and agency of water in different ways uh, than uh, kind of a state decision would although some of them overlap, and I'll point to the Wanganui River as an important example of that, where you have uh, the, the Aotearoa New Zealand legislation, and you have uh, that basis of Maori law that fits into the preamble of it, and it's given effect through uh, trust, uh, so having appointed trustees. Um, but we do have other examples of Indigenous nations affirming, for example, on the Klamath River, um, bylaw and resolutions, um, and also things that extend beyond water. So in here, here we have White Earth's Rights of Monoman Declaration of 2016, which recognizes this inherent right to exist, flourish, regenerate, evolve, um, to you know, inherent rights to restoration, recovery, and preservation which also includes the right to a healthy climate and freshwater habitat. So this is not a legal personhood of water. This is giving effect to a primary relative of the nation and recognizing the, the rights of monoman or wild rice. So we do water protection here through a different mechanism and in a space where the white earth um, nation actually has this jurisdictional authority relating to its wild rice. And so, you know, I think these are really interesting examples of how different nations have taken up those sets of responsibilities. And we have an example in Canada through the Magpie River um, where legal personhood was granted um, or um, enacted through a bylaw, but also a regional municipality has a sister resolution. So the two track, you know, side by side, they're one and, and the same, but they're not compressed. They sit as two different legal authorities and jurisdiction that are doing uh, the same thing in terms of recognizing the uh, legal rights of the river and granting it nine rights or, or recognizing nine rights to it, uh, including rights to flow and maintain biodiversity uh, and the right to take legal action. 
So here there's that idea again of personhood as a right to act as a legal actor. And here they have a representation through guardians that are appointed uh, in these different bodies to, um, and that, you know, to act on behalf of the river that have the duty um, to the, ensure the protection of those nine granted rights. Um, we also have another example in British Columbia where the Sturgeon River uh, is recognized as a rights holder, so a being that has uh, rights. And in Treaty 3, through the work of the Grand Council and uh, the Women's um, Council, uh, recognition of the rights of Nibi and uh, a declaration that explains in a non-prescriptive way what those sets of responsibilities are. And that's based on Anishinaabe law, also the direction that was given by elders and that went through an entire community process of regional gatherings uh, and then a national forum and then a national assembly uh, full ratification by the nation itself. So this is an important exercise of law. It doesn't look like legislation, but it's a declaration that sets out those principles and parameters around water governance within the Treaty 3 area from the Anishinaabe perspective, and that invites everyone into that relationship of uh, responsibility. We also have some thinking uh, and, and action that's been happening around uh, personhood of Lake Winnipeg or the protection of the lake. And part of that initiative uh, meant doing water exchanges with different um, regions where water bodies had legal personhood. So uh, taking, you know, taking some of this water in, in ceremony according to the protocols of, um, you know, in Grand Rapids with uh, Cree women, jurisdiction holders, taking some of this water to the Wanganui, to the Ganges and Yamuna in, uh, India and to the Atrato in Colombia and exchanging the water so that we can build on that concept of legal personhood and spiritedness and agency and ask the lake, what would you like? What can we do to try and protect, um, protect you? Uh, and that's one of the questions that I think comes with legal personhood. Is it something that's desirable to these water bodies and thinking about the ceremonial and spiritual uh, aspects of that through this kind of exchange, water exchange work. And also thinking about water, a water treaty, which is currently in development and meant to engage the whole of the watershed. So thinking about uh, all of the, the different regions from which this water comes uh, and meets in, in the Lake Winnipeg, in Lake Winnipeg, um, building a treaty around those relationships of responsibility to the water that comes together in the lake. And that's something that's under development uh, currently with partners from across uh, the, the watershed. So like I said at the outset, um, I think we have an opportunity right now with the New Canada Water Agency with a revised freshwater uh, policy and thinking about a new uh, legislation, a New Canada Water Act or a revised one to engage with uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, including concepts like free prior and informed consent, and also considering very seriously Indigenous laws and legal orders, and that spiritual relationship that is meant to be preserved for future generations, and to build that into any efforts of water governance uh, in Canada, and recognition of Indigenous laws in any of those processes of governance. And I'll take a step, step back and kind of contextualize some of my thinking around that is um, in large part, Indigenous nations have been involved in water governance in kind of the management piece. So at the, the fringes, not the high level decision making, but more in terms of, you know, how do we manage this particular problem rather than thinking holistically about watersheds and good governance within the whole of the territory and the different and multiple interactions, like that example of, you know, asserting jurisdiction over Monoman, but acknowledging that water is a, an extremely significant part of that. So, 
you know, involvement of Indigenous laws and legal orders at those high level governance tables, not only in terms of process and involvement, um, but running that process from the perspective of Indigenous um, procedural principles and also substantive principles of decision making, which ultimately we can understand draw in Indigenous science and Indigenous knowledge into both the process and the substance of how decisions are made and ultimately what decisions are made. So I think those are extremely significant parts of how we can think about a just uh, and positive water future in Canada. So I'll leave it at that. I know I'm a fast talker, so I, I was trying to make sure that we'd have a lot of time for questions and discussion uh, as part of this webinar today. So miigwech. Thank you so much, Emmy. <laughs> um, so we'll uh, ask you to put your questions in the q and I, I see a lot of applause coming in there. Um, let's see. Uh, I have a hand up. Can you put your question in the chat? I guess while we're waiting for that, um, I have a question. So with the Wanganui River, um, so the kind of process there is a, a kind of uh, further along than a lot of kind of other places. And so we get to see this process of implementation. Um, so this big, there's a big idea of kind of acknowledging the personhood of water and kind of the um, important implications of that. But then it gets like, how do you get down to the nitty gritty of actually like implementing that? Um, and I'm wondering if you've looked at some of the kind of um, learnings out of that context, um, including both the challenges and, and, and positives um, that we could learn from here. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. And I think in large part, the jury is out in terms of what the actual implementation of a lot of this looks like. It's still under development in, in a lot of these different contexts. Um, having done a recent exchange with the folks from the Columbia context, the Atrato River and the Guardians uh, that were set up, you know, they're still very much working on figuring this out, even though they have a mandate from the constitutional court to exist and do this work. Um, in terms of the the Wanganui, I think um, there's the part of the challenge is, is how you govern with different sets of principles and different interests over a singular water body. And how do you do that in ethical ways? Um, often the the you know the big questions are, that are going to come up are resources and then how to resolve conflict that arises. And there aren't easy answers to those questions. I think, part of it too uh, that that needs to be acknowledged and it has been in in some of the literature is that this um resolution is actually born out of conflict and and it's a settlement of a, a claim a treaty claim to the one um the waitangi tribunal so you know the how things rest side by side um together in interwoven ways um also evolves over time so um, you know, I think that there's a lot to consider about the success of identifying a water body with parameters. And I think that's one of the things that this that does well is that it it it's not um, kind of outside of the scope of something that's identifiable. It's one river with a beginning and end and an identify uh, identified uh, nation interest, uh, you know, Maori interest in the Wanganui tribe and um and it has supporting legislation. So the that, that mandate is significantly entrenched um, both in the settlement and in the uh, in the, the legislation. So but I think in large part, um, you know, it it, it um, is is challenging to think about, uh, you know, whether or not implementation is a success or not. Um, recently did a report with David Suzuki Foundation and uh, my colleague Rachel Plotkin and we um, kind of mapped out the different collaborative processes and some of the benefits and downfalls of of each. And um, you know, there is no perfect model that we were able to find, um, but I think that you know, in trying and continuing to develop them, there's some potential for for real uh, meaningful change. Great, thank you. 
Um, so uh, Dr. Steph McLaughlin, who I believe is coming from Treaty 8 territory today, put a question in the in the uh, chat. So I just wanted to address that one first before we go to the one in the Q&A. Um, so um, he states, as a lawyer and an Indigenous person, uh, what do you see as the implied implications of legal personhood in terms of changing the way dominant society treats water, both in Canada and beyond? I think it comes down to sets of values. So what informs our decision making, both legal and political, is the sets of values that we approach. And that's why I encouraged us to think at the end about both the process, you know, doing things in ways that have Indigenous process woven into them, which will help us get to different sets of values and then make principled decision making based on those sets of values. And when you think back to the slide that I showed that had, you know, the foundational um, principles of Inakonagewan versus Western legal principles, and that difference, right? Individual, sorry, individuals here, individual <laughs> and uh, relational, and the idea of protection of private property versus a collective sense of well being. I mean, it doesn't take uh, any degree to figure out that there are major differences between those sets of, those core sets of values that underlie the whole of each of those legal systems, right? So, uh, you know, how can it be, what, what are the implications? I think we might come to different outcomes if we're using um, Indigenous sets of, of values in our, our decision-making. Um, one example of that is found in the recent publication that we have, uh, Jill, Dr. Jill Blakely from USASC and myself, we co-edited a volume uh, called In Our Backyard, and it was exploring the Kiask development in Northern Manitoba. And it was building on a process before the Clean Environment Commission that had found that there were no significant residual adverse effects to the building of the Kiask hydroelectric dam. And, you know, significant residual are very big qualifiers on adverse effects. Adverse, I think, is also a, a qualifier. So you're building up these, you know, these different um, qualifiers on impact. And from the, I, I think most of the Cree perspectives that were presented in the um, in the hearing, you could see that mitigation measures were not enough to actually make determinations of no significant residual adverse effects. From the Cree perspective, they did find that there were significant impacts. Um, mitigation didn't actually change that. Mitigation was kind of a measure that sat separately and apart from the, the determination of impact. And so I think that's part of this, you know, the different worldviews, but I think it's more than that. It's based on different systems of decision-making and then arriving at a conclusion. Whereas in this kind of provincial state law, you can chip away at the impact with mitigation. In the Cree legal system, that wasn't the same. It, there was no chipping away. They kind of stood as two separate determinations and then a decision to move forward. Um, and it's, so you see an inca incompatibility there. And I think that if there was more regard to um, you know, decision making from those Indigenous perspectives, there could be potentially more honest outcomes in saying, yes, there's impact, yes, there's mitigation, and we decide to move forward. Thank you so much. Um, oh, we've got questions rolling in in the Q&A now. So we have a question from Ruth Kerr. Um, which, uh, do you feel um, it is important for those involved in the Canada Water Agency to understand Indigenous ways, specifically procedural principles? Absolutely. And I think that in some cases, the Canada Water Agency might want to defer to those principles um, in, its, uh, in its process in certain regions where Indigenous nations have taken up that authority and jurisdiction and are ready to be part of that governance exercise. For example, Treaty 3 with the Nibe Declaration, right? It's, it's ready to go uh, in terms of 
playing a significant role of governance within the that watershed. Great, thanks. Um, so I could be wrong, but this uh, it was posted by an anonymous end attendee, but I believe it's uh, Mona Maxwell. Um, accidentally posting as anonymous. Um, so uh, she said, uh, I arrived a bit late, so my apologies if my question is redundant, but uh, my question is, can you comment, advise on the specific challenges or the biggest opportunities for Lake Winnipeg watershed in the context of expertise? Is it unique in any way in terms of your area of expertise? Um, you have certainly given a lot of broad ideas here um, that likely apply for sure. I guess it's like, is there anything unique about the Lake Winnipeg watershed um, beyond some of the examples that you gave? I think the unique defining factor of Lake Winnipeg watershed is the multiple jurisdictions at play. Um, so the international dimension um, and the multi-provincial jurisdictional dimensions. Also the fact that the Lake Winnipeg watershed involves um, ice fields and um, water in the Rocky Mountains that's coming, that's snow and ice that makes its way. And the fact that it ultimately runs into, um, you know, the Hudson's Bay through the Nelson River system. So there's a lot of unique defining features. I think the second piece, this will be of no surprise to anyone who knows me, is the fact that it's a reservoir um, for hydroelectric development. So it's a holding, um, it, it is a holding body for water that ultimately, um, who's, that's, whose flow is regulated to feed into a hydroelectric uh, system that also comes through on the, the Winnipeg River, some hydroelectric dams. And, and uh, so that should be acknowledged as well. So it's it's a water body, but you know what we think of in terms of pollution of fresh water uh, in, in other spaces is amplified by the fact that this is uh, power generating water. Thank you. And um, that leads in, uh, you know, nicely to this next question by Anna Lee, um, kind of about the different states and forms of water. So can it be, be um, would you, uh, can it be, be all kinds of water like lake, oceans, rivers, plus different forms of water like gas, liquid, and solid as well, uh, in ice form. So maybe it's asking, um, would you use the term nibby to refer to all of those forms of water? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not a fluent language speaker, and I wouldn't want to overstep on that front. Um, and I know that in the discussions of the Nibe Declaration of Treaty 3, there was an agreement to use that term to reflect kind of water generally and all forms of water. Um, but there are specific terms in Anishinaabe when to refer to a river, CP, or um, to a lake. Um, and, you know, those different waterscapes, like, for example, here, water flowing into the lake, the space is called Saugeen, right, where the river flows into the lake. Um, so it is kind of a general term that is used for a lot of different forms of water. But then when you think about those different forms uh, as geograph or water forms, hy hydro hydrology of water, it, there are specific names and different forms like ice and, and rainwater and things like that will have their own names. Even uh, underground aquifers and uh, marsh waters will have different yeah, so it's it's an overall um, use term uh, that sits imperfectly. It's like saying water H two O. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, so actually, in the chat, we have a question by Daniel Canoe. Um, so um, he states, uh, "When Indigenous peoples assert rights, Canadian courts sometimes state public interest as a reason to overrule." or undermine Indigenous interests? Uh, what can be done in these situations? That's a good question. And I think the response of legal personhood is, uh, it's a response to that, um, that, the, um, that you're trying to position water bodies as having rights in and of themselves. Um, and I think the response, you know, the more direct legal response to Daniel's question is um, the, the um, 
the public interest versus indigenous rights. In some spheres, there's a priority to indigenous rights and invoking constitutional treaty and Aboriginal rights along with the United Nations Declaration, I think show some promise uh, in terms of affirmation of those rights. But the landscape has not been great in terms of Canadian courts acknowledging indigenous um, priorities in relation to water. So I think there's a long uh, road ahead. Um, another way I think of potentially addressing that is asserting jurisdiction, affirming jurisdiction, and then being able to demonstrate in courts that Indigenous people are taking up that jurisdiction themselves, and that that then can pose a question of those competing laws and something that would have to be dealt with in the realm of not just a dependency on the recognition of rights, but addressing the conflict that arises from these uh, systems of law that are incompatible. That sounded like a lot of legal theory, but in practice, I think, you know, trying a lot of different strategies and hopefully um, we can get to some some positive recognition. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, we have another question by uh, Dr. Steph McLaughlin. Um, so it says the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, also located in Winnipeg, has substantial has had substantial growing pains when it comes to recognizing and reflecting the impacts of colonization um, on Indigenous peoples in Canada, and it arguably still does. Is there any reason to expect the Canada Water Agency will be different? Why or why not? So, yeah, I guess just a question about Canada Water Agency and, um, yeah. Yeah. I'm still optimistic, and um, I know that from the outset, in uh, thinking about the, even before the agency was, uh, uh, after it was announced, but before it was established, that there was significant engagement on uh, Indigenous peoples having a role in water governance, and that there's been a um, process of engagement with nations throughout the establishment of the agency process and thinking about how um, it can be responsive. Uh, if you look at the federal government's messaging, it does speak to Indigenous peoples directly, which um, you know other organizations that have been set up kind of didn't mention it explicitly or um, hadn't gone through that, that same thought process. So absolutely no guarantee, but it's been part of the conversation since the outset of thinking about the agency. And so that gives me some hope that there will be more meaningful engagement with Indigenous peoples and uh, Indigenous governance and law. Hey, thank you. Um, there was like a quick question in the um, chat as well about the water treaty fact sheet, I think that you mentioned in your presentation and whether that might uh, be available um, for the audience to look at as a resource. Mm -hmm. It should be on the decolonizing water website or social media. Um, if it's not, I'll, I'll ask, <laughs> just make sure that it is there. Um, and it's still in very much in development. Um, uh, so I'm making a note myself, um, water treaty fact sheet, and it provides some basic information. There's also a pamphlet that we handed out at the Nibi gathering last year. Uh, that explores some of the concepts that I talked about today and the water treaty. Uh, I would link this also to the Buffalo Treaty that was developed by the Blackfoot Confederacy and partners uh, in uh, developing, redeveloping their relationship with the Buffalo and the treaty that they built with the Buffalo Nation and um, their nations together that has received a significant amount of support from uh, other outside stakeholders outside of the nation and that um, we use as part of the model. And um, Leroy Little Bear, who was instrumental in the building of that treaty, is also working with us on the, uh, the water treaty. Wonderful. Um, so we have time for, uh, I guess, I think one last question, uh, just uh, uh, Ruth Kurrigan asking, um, following up here, um, if there's time, <laughs> uh, what do you think, um, what do you feel is important for the Canada Water Agency to understand about Indigenous procedural principles? Mm -hmm. uh, I do want to note at this juncture that there isn't kind of one Indigenous approach. So what the Canada Water Agency is going to have to deal with is multiple different approaches in different regions 
and with different nations. Um, but I think one of the things that is common to a lot of the uh, Indigenous procedural approaches that I've been exposed to is the idea of timeliness and thinking about who are the appropriate actors in making decisions. Um, so how much time you spend making a decision um, and you know who to involve in that decision making are two very important procedural elements that may be very different when you're acknowledging the Indigenous procedural approach. Um, that and thinking about, you know, how that then engages other sets of, of, um, of principles uh, into the process. In some of my work on treaties and the, the making of treaties historically, you know, the elements of feasting and pipe. And so the ceremonial aspects also uh, the the jurisdictional pieces of acknowledging jurisdiction and working out um, decision making authority at the front end um, were important kind of procedural elements that had connotations for the substance of of you know how how decisions were made and and what decisions uh, ultimately were. So, yeah, okay. ceremonial aspects, recognition of spiritedness time uh, and uh, and you know who should be part of those decisions. And I think the idea of ongoing consent that's in FPIC also has a very important role to play in thinking about process. You know, the idea of not having um, necessarily immediate and final responses to absolutely everything, thinking that there is some room for example, for adaptive management as part of Canada's freshwater future. Great, thanks so much. Um, yeah, a lots, a lots coming up here with the Canada Water Agency, and I'm looking to forward to seeing how um, things develop, um, and hopefully some of these ideas can be can be implemented there. Um, so I think with that, um, I'll say thank you so much for your talk today, and for everyone who attended and um, asked such engaging questions. Um, we have. Um, We'll be posting the recording of this uh, talk uh, to our uh, to the uh, sustainability YouTube channel as well as to our website soon. So, for anyone who wants to rewatch, I'm sure there are people who uh, would like to kind of revisit some of the ideas you shared, um, as well as other people. Um, it will uh, be there. Uh, we also have uh, already posted our talk from last um, last session with Ayush Kumar to our page. So please go there um, and check it out as well as register for our, our future talks. Um, I believe our next talk is on November 20th um, with uh, Zuzu Kuzik, um, who will speak about the EU Coastal Habitat Comprehensive Research Project. So please join us then. Um, again, thank you so much, MA. Um, always uh, just such a pleasure to hear you speak. So um, with that, I'll say goodbye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>